Hey church family, good morning. Pastor Jason here. It is so great to see you again. We've been praying for you all week long that God would do something special in your hearts and life today. I want to remind you, since this is Labor Day weekend, we only have one service at our Harvest Campus at 9.30 this morning. So if you show up at 11, we won't be here, but we definitely will miss you. And don't forget, next Sunday is our ninth birthday celebration as a church. It is going to be in incredible day. We have a special gift and a treat for everyone who's in attendance. We want to celebrate all God has done and we want to dream about all God has for our future as a church. And then lastly, on the 18th, we have our small group preview day. Have an opportunity to learn about all of the small groups that are going to be happening this fall. We've got Bible studies, video studies, community service groups, fun social groups, all built to help you grow and help you connect with others 
other people. Listen, let's pray together and then let's dig into God's word this morning. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity. God, just to be in your presence, to worship you, to learn from your word that is alive and powerful. And God, whether people are in person this morning, whether they're worshiping from their homes, God, maybe it's a hospital bed. Maybe it's even on vacation over this holiday weekend. God, I ask you, would you meet us right where we're at? Can we experience your power and presence in a manifest way? Would you speak to us corporately, but also specifically and individually? And God, would you change our lives? Would we be different when we get done watching than when we started? Jesus, we love you. We're gonna give you the honor and the glory for what you do. And Jesus, it's in your name we pray, amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about Nehemiah. We've really just been walking through the book of Nehemiah and examining his life and looking how we can do what God has called us to do, how we can live a legacy, how we can build the future, the destiny that God has for each and every one of us, just like Nehemiah did. And last week, if you were with us, we honed in on the importance of healthy conflict, right? How do we take conflict seriously without seriously hurting? other people. We saw that Nehemiah was up against tremendous opposition. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem came after Nehemiah. They tried to discredit him. They tried to charge him with treason and they really tried to tear down everything that God was calling him to do. But in the end, ultimately, this group of people that Nehemiah had called together, they rebuilt the walls. They rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in a matter of 52 days. Can you imagine? 52 days. We can't put up a house that fast. It takes 52 days to get the paperwork approved in the city or county. And they were able to build the walls. They were able to put the gates back in place so that Jerusalem could thrive, so that Jerusalem could be protected and the people could live out the destiny that God had called them to. And when you get to the middle of the book of Nehemiah, you may have been reading and thought, oh my gosh, Can I make it through the rest of this? There are lots of names. There are lots of numbers. They're really just a bunch of lists. You can make it through. Keep reading. Because remember, Nehemiah was a leader administrator. He was a great record keeper. And so in the middle of this book of Nehemiah, we see a chronicle of all of the different people who were exiled, who began to come back to Jerusalem. And I think it's fun because every number represents a life. Every name represents a person, a story, a dream. It was a person who was integral to Jerusalem being rebuilt and being restored back to what God had for it. And as we move into these last chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9, that we're going to be able to do together, what we see is we see this community of people coming together to celebrate all God had done. They're excited. They're pumped. Do you remember what we said a few weeks ago? As you accomplish God's vision for your life, you've got to celebrate the wins. You tell people about all God has done. And this is what the people had come together to do. They were celebrating what God was doing in Jerusalem. And for some reason, at some point, in the middle of this mass gathering of people, somebody said, hey, we should call Ezra the scribe. Maybe we should get Ezra to come out and read God's word to us. And they did that. And when they did, friends, it changed everything. You see, what we've got to understand is over the past couple of weeks, maybe some of you feel frustrated. Maybe you've begun to think, well, God hasn't given me this big, amazing vision for my life. And so maybe God hasn't called you to build a business or maybe God hasn't called you to build a church or a nonprofit or blog or write a book. And so maybe you think to yourself, since God hasn't called me to do this big, spectacular thing, maybe God doesn't have a plan for me. Listen, this is what I want you to hear today. When it comes to building your future, who you are is more important than what you do. Who you are is more important than what you do because ultimately, more than anything else, God has called you and God has called me to become more like His Son, Jesus Christ. We can't get so caught up in what we're going to do that we forget about who God has called us to be, our character. And the more we get to know God, the more we hear His voice, the more we're willing to listen to His voice, what happens is we begin to see things 
in every single moment of every single day that will make an impact in other people's lives. And so that's what we're going to land today. We're going to talk about who God wants us to be. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8 and chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible with you, the verses are going to be on the screen. And friends, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We have free Bibles. We would love for you to come by and pick up. We'll ship them to you. We want to make sure you have a copy of God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's start in verse Verse 2. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Let's skip down to verse 5. Ezra stood on the platform in view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Listen, if you're going to be who God has called you to be, the first thing you have to do is examine your priorities. You have to examine your priorities. The people of Israel had done what God had called them to do. They built the wall. They built it in 52 days. They were working day and night. They were pouring their hearts and their lives and their blood and their sweat and their tears into making this happen. And when everyone got together to celebrate, they realized something's missing. They were missing a component of honoring God. They were missing that component of celebrating what God had done. They were missing the component of worship. And in our lives, if we're going to get past what we do and get to the root of who we are, we have to examine the priorities in our life. My question to you is, have you set spiritual priorities in your life? I'm not talking about a spiritual routine. I'm not talking about a checklist of things that you have to mark out every day. I'm saying inside of you, is God the single most important thing in your life? Is He number one? Are you more passionate about Him than anything else? Because when we change our focus, when we make God the priority, Scripture says that everything else falls into place. When we focus on God with everything that we are, He begins to pour His desires into our heart so that our desires actually match His desires. He will do that for us when we honor Him. What does that look like? Well, for Israel, it meant they got out the book of the law, the Scriptures. They listened to the scripture. Someone taught them scriptures in a way that they could understand it. And maybe in your life, God's word needs to be a priority. Maybe it's taking time each day or taking time during the week to spend a little time in the Bible. Spend some time with a devotional. I encourage you, spend time in God's word. Because we spend so much time frustrated and wondering what God wants us to do or saying things like, God, why aren't you speaking to me? And God is saying, I've already spoken to you, child. I've given you my word. Spend time in it. I love that the scripture says they begin to chant, amen, amen. Let it be done. Let it be so. As the word was read, they lifted their hands. Maybe we need to reprioritize the way that we worship. Listen, there's corporate worship and there's individual worship. We come together and sing and worship God, that even in our private times alone with God, we can get our favorite worship song, we can sing, we can praise, we can lift our hands, we can bow on our face before God. We need to prioritize worship. Let's keep going. Verse 14, as they studied the law, they discovered that the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should live in shelters during the festival to be held that month. He had said that a proclamation should be made throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, telling the people to go to the hills and get branches from olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees. They were to use these branches to make shelters in which they would live during the festival as prescribed in the law. So as they were worshiping and as they were celebrating and as Ezra was reading God's word, that hadn't been done publicly in years. They were standing and celebrating. They were soaking it up. They were learning. And then they realized there is this festival that we are commanded to celebrate. And and either we haven't been observing it or we haven't been observing it the right way. It's called the Festival of Shelters because they were supposed to go and get palm leaves and build shelters, build huts to live in during this festival. And it was a reminder to them 
of everything their forefathers had went through in Egypt. How God had rescued them from slavery. How they had spent time in the desert. It was a reminder of how over and over and over again God was faithful. He provided everything that they needed. But they had just not taken the time. It's something that they forgot about. So as soon as they heard about it, as soon as they saw it, they jumped right in. They said, let's issue a proclamation. Go get all this stuff. We're going to build our shelters. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun, does it? I don't think I want to go out and live in a hut outside of my house, but there, there's a beautiful principle behind this. If you're going to have a life that leaves a legacy, the second thing that you have to do is you have to reflect on your journey. You've got to reflect on your journey. The reason God set up these festivals is so that His people would never forget what He had done for them. God did not want them to forget how faithful He was. And we too have to reflect on our journey. I've heard people say, well, the past is the past. And if you think about the journey of your life, if you think about everything that has happened over the years, I don't know about you, but I feel like everything that has happened in the past has been built to equip me, to prepare me, to get me ready for what God wants me to do now and in the future. I would say my life now is different than it was years ago because my past helped shape me. That God has brought me through a process and maybe God has brought you through a process as well so that your life is different now than it was years ago. That is why we have to remember the process, the journey. Because as believers, when we become a Christian, it can become so easy to get in a Christian bubble, to get rid of our friends that aren't Christians, to just be involved in church things and forget about everything else going on in our life. It's, it's really easy to get away from community. It's really easy to start thinking that, man, I've got something uh, better than everybody else. My spiritual life is just more put together than everybody else. But when we stop for a moment and when we think, about the junk that was in our lives and the mess that we've walked and the testimonies that we have and the tests that we've been through, it's a beautiful reminder to us that it's not about what we have done. No, it's all about what God has done in our life. We get to think back about all the things that God has saved us from, all the things that Jesus has saved us from, all the things that He has changed in our life, how He has made our life better. And maybe you're watching and there's never been a point where you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to hear me. Jesus can change your life. It can be completely different. Your future can be different than it is right now. I've seen it happen too many times in people's lives. Remember your journey. Reflect on it. Because when you remember what God has done in your life, friends, you're going to want to follow Him even more. And when time gets tough, When you have those tough times, those difficult situations, it's easier to push through when you've seen what God has already done and you know in your heart you have faith that He's going to do it again. They continued to celebrate. They continued to cry out to God. And the Israelites in chapter 9, they even decided, hey, we want to make a commitment to God. We want to make a commitment to obey Him completely, to obey Him totally. They said, we don't want to live through this mess again. We don't want to be taken over by an enemy army again. We don't want the walls of Jerusalem to be torn down again. We don't want to be captured and taken into exile again. So we are going to follow God with everything that we are. And in chapter 9, verse 38, the people responded to everything was going on and they said, in view of all of this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. You see, they didn't want to just say, God, we're making a commitment to you. He said, we're going to put it on paper. We're going to seal it. We want this to be official. We want everybody to know there is going to be a change in our life. There's going to be a difference in us. And so the third thing that we have to do, if we're going to change, if we're going to be everything that God has called us to be, is we have a life that we choose to obey. We choose to obey. Building your future is directly linked to daily obedience. That's it. If you will daily do what God has called you to do, if you'll listen, then you will live a legacy. You'll build the future that God has for you. There will be this legacy of life change. There will be people around you who say, my life is different because of what they said or because of what they did. My life is different because they listen to God. They follow God with their whole heart and life. 
Friends, obedience is one of the most difficult things we can encounter in the Christian life because of our sin nature. By our sin nature, we want to be disobedient. I want to be disobedient more than I'm obedient, and you do too. I want to do it my way. I want to be my own boss. I want to be in charge. So I have to choose. I have to choose obedience. And if we will become a people that will obey God's voice, there is nothing, nothing that can stop us from changing the world and changing this community and changing our families and changing our friendships and changing our workplaces. It's obedience. But maybe you're watching this morning and you'd say, Jason, there's never been a time in my life where I've placed my faith in Jesus. There's never been a time in my life where I've chosen to follow God. I don't feel like I have a personal relationship with God. I need you to understand that you can have just that. You can have a personal relationship with the God of the universe who created everything. He can be your friend. He can be your confidant. He can guide you through your life. And the Bible says that God loves you and God loves me so much that he stepped out of heaven and put flesh on as the God man, Jesus Christ. He walked the earth. He loved people. He taught people. He healed people. He ministered to people. And after three years of pouring his life into ministry, he gave his life up. He willingly allowed himself to be crucified, to die on the cross, to have his blood spilt, to pay the cost of our sin and disobedience. Somebody had to pay the cost for sin. And it could either be us or it could be Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm willing to do it. Three days later, he rose again from the grave and proved that he was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God in the flesh. And Jesus is still alive today, and he is still changing lives, and he wants to forgive you, and he wants to make you brand new. He wants you to have a fresh start. He wants you to have a do-over so that you can live a blessed, abundant life on this earth and have a home in heaven with him when you die. You don't have to face punishment. Jesus can change your life today. And I want to give you that opportunity. I just want to ask you, if that's you, and you'd say, Jason, I want to place my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if this prayer reflects what God is doing, I invite you to pray it with me. You can pray it out loud if you want to. You can pray it to yourself. God can hear you either way, but pray something like this. God, thank you for loving me even when I was unlovable. God, thank you for pursuing me even when I was disobedient. God, thank you for sending Jesus to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, and to rise again from the grave so that I could be forgiven. God, would you forgive me today? Would you take everything in my past and wipe it clean? Would you give me a future today where, God, you're the one in charge? Jesus, I am yours. You are my Lord, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if that was you, it's the greatest decision that you could ever make with your life. All of heaven is celebrating, and we are celebrating along with heaven for you. But I want to ask you, please don't change the channel. Please don't turn this video off without letting us know about the decision that you made. You can go to our website right now and click I'm new. Give us a name, an email address, a phone number, just some way to reach out. We're not going to show up at your house, but we want to send you some resources to help you grow in your faith. And I want to be able to pray for you specifically by name that you really would become everything that God's called and created you to be. Friends, at Refuge Church, we love you, and Jesus loves you. And Jesus is for you, and we are for you. And if there is ever anything that we can do to minister to you, please do not hesitate to reach out, call the church office. It would be our honor and privilege to pray for you, connect you to resources, or help you in any way. We love you. And I cannot wait to celebrate the ninth birthday of Refuge Church with you next week. Have a great week. Now go and be the church.